Welcome to Small Arm Solutions. Today we're looking at what I call Glock Generations. We're going to be looking at the Glock Generations from Generation 1 through Generation 5. Now, many of you have said that uh, you think I'm a Glock fanboy. Well, I'd be honest with you, I am. You know, somebody who has access to the amount of firearms that I have and who's tested the amount of firearms I have, I guess, the end, uh, really where the metal meets the meat is what's on, this, on my side when I walk out of the house, which is generally always a Glock 42, a Glock 30, or a Glock 19. But we're going to be talking about the generations of just the Model 17. Obviously, we know that Glocks come in many different calibers and so forth. But what we're going to do is we're going to be following it through Generation 1 through Generation 5. And there's going to be some interesting stories with a couple of these pistols, too. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to jump right into this. This is going to go back to, I would say, 1963 with the opening of Glock GmbH in uh, Deutsche Wagen, Austria. Uh, it started off as a few-man company, as a company that was uh, building uh, products based on new polymer technologies. Uh, when they first got into it, they were doing things such as military. They were doing some military products such as non disintegrating machine gun belts, uh, grenade casings, practice grenades, and, and cutting tools and so forth. Uh, they had not had any experience in firearms whatsoever. Um, you know, they had never designed anything. They, were, they had nothing to do with it. And that wasn't really until 1980 or so uh, when the Austrian Army came out with a requirement to replace their aging uh, World War II era P-38 pistols with a new modern pistol. Now, of course, Glock, uh, they specialized in polymer, so that was obviously the way they were going to go. Now, I do want to make uh, very clear that the first polymer frame pistol was not Glock. Uh, it was HK with the VP-70. The VP-70 was less, uh, definitely would say less than a successful pistol. Uh, not so, so much because of the materials, I think because uh, more so of the horrid, horrid trigger uh, that it had. Uh, it was a sort of a unique operating system as well. But it just was not really well received back then, probably for the same reason the M16 wasn't. It was too new. It was too new of a technology uh, that wasn't the traditional steel 1911. So people were just not going to, uh, they just weren't going to accept it. Uh, same thing with the M16. You know, you, know, it was, you had polymer, you had alloy frames, you had you know, aluminum. It was from the aircraft industry. It was not the traditional iron and wood that uh, we've been so used to. But uh, once his country called for a new pistol, they went to work. Um, Mr. Glock, Gaston Glock is his name, he assembled a panel of uh, gun experts throughout Europe to come up with the most desirable features. And what he came up with was the Glock 17. Now, the Glock 17, as many people have a misunderstanding that the, the 17 comes from the magazine capacity of 17 rounds. No, it does not. Um, the 17 was his 17th patent. That's where it came from. And what the pistol that he came out with is basically what you see here. Uh, what we see here is a Glock Gen 1. Uh, the Austrian designation was the P80 pistol. Within the development process of one year, Glock came out with a working uh, prototype of, of their pistol. And it was definitely new, uh, striker fired. There were some different things we're going to get into about the uh, the mechanics and the design of it that certainly separated it from uh, anything uh, prior to. In 1981, the first uh, Model 17 Glock went to the Austrian Army for testing. And the testing went incredibly well. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through uh, what made this pistol rather interesting and unique. The first we have here was the, the, the polymer frame. The entire frame was made out of an advanced polymer. Now, I, I will be the first one to admit when I first saw a Glock, I, you know, I fell into the bandwagon and it was cheap. You know, it was uh, Tupperware, tactical Tupperware, and you had to have a bottle of epoxy. But come to find that uh, one of the things the polymer does is absorb shock rather than takes the same kind of wear that a steel would on a steel frame. Uh, which enabled this gun to be able to fire plus P and plus P plus ammunition, which a uh, few other guns could do on a steady basis. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about really is the barrel. Uh, the barrel was unique in the fact that it was a cold hammer forged barrel using the uh, shallow rifling or the polygon rifling. Now, that has a lot of benefits to uh, over the conventional standard uh, cut rifling. First off, you don't have any sharp lands and grooves, so there's nothing to wear. So, uh, you have a barrel that last pretty much the entire life of the pistol, which uh, in this case has been well over 100,000 rounds that this uh, polymer frame pistol has been able to handle. Now, by having the shallow lands and grooves, a couple things happen. First, the overall choke or the diameter of the barrel is tighter. So by not having a cutting in and the bullet squeezing down the barrel, you're getting a higher velocity by having a tighter gas seal. The gas is not steeping around the projectile. It's all staying behind, so you're getting more of a powder burn, which can give you higher velocity. So by using the polygon barrel, we have more we have more accuracy, we have a higher velocity, we have no wear. And those are major improvements over anything that's ever been done before. 
The only negative aspect to it was uh, in the end of using the lead, just due to the fact that you had the shallow rifling and the way that it would strip the lead uh, as the bullet would go past, the lead would stay in the barrel and that could eventually cause a rupture because of over overpressure. So with the polygon type barrels, you don't want to mess around with lead ammunition. You only want to use full metal jacket ammunition. Next thing we'll talk about is the magazine. As we spoke, it was a 17 shot magazine. Now the original magazines were designed to swell. Once you loaded the magazines up, it would not drop free. Uh, that was as per requirement of the Austrian army because they didn't want to have uh, drop the magazine and have it drop into the snow and not be able to find it because the Austrian army at the time only issued one magazine with the pistol. So you had a 17 shot magazine. Now Glock also offered a plus two, which enabled you to have 19 rounds in the magazine. So if you think about that for the time, you're looking at uh, a 19-round magazine plus one of the chambers. So in you know, one pistol, you're carrying 20 rounds. And now what we want to talk about is the action. Now, this pistol is not what you would call double action. It's not what you would call single action. Glock refers to it as safe action. Now, what that means is you have a striker-fired pistol, which meaning you have the trigger is pulled to the rear, so is the striker, which is the firing pin. And as you pull back, you're, you're compressing the spring on the striker. Once the trigger reaches its full rearward movement and the trigger is pulled all the way, the trigger releases the striker to strike the primer, which detonates the cartridge. But uh, there are also three safeties involved in this as well. We're going to show the cutaway here, and we're going to be showing you some pictures of this that's going to make this look a lot, a lot better. Now, as we see here on the cutaway, and by the way, these are all dummy rounds, we see here is the striker. And we see here is the striker spring. And we can also see the fact that this is not fully engaged. It's not fully loaded on the spring. As we pull the trigger to the rear, we can see how that striker is moving rearward. Spring is compressing. Now we see what's referred to as the connector. Right here, this is the trigger bar. So as the trigger is pulled, it goes all the way to the rear. Now we have a full load. When, this, when the trigger is released, this is not fully loaded. The pistol is in a safe condition, as you see right here. You're looking at a 60% load on that spring. So the spring is not fully uh, fully contracted. As we pull the trigger, we have it coming to the rear where the trigger bar is reaching the connector. And now, to fire the pistol, we only have 34% left on the spring to, to be pulled back before it will engage. So as the trigger is pulled, you'll see that it hits the connector and fires. And that's what sets it off. So we want to see what the three safeties are on here. First, we have what's referred to as a trigger safety. This is a physical lever which prevents the trigger from being pulled unless the lever is pushed in. It's a safety. So no matter how you drop it, this thing is not going to go off unless the trigger is manually pulled. The next one's referred to as the firing pin safety, which we see right here. This is a physical piece of metal that blocks the forward movement of the firing pin. And after you disengage the lever safety, the striker goes all the way to the rear. And once it goes all the way to the rear, there is a lever that we see right here. That lever will, if we pull back, will engage and disengage the firing pin safety. So that's number two. So we have number one is the lever. Number two is a firing pin safety. Number three is what's referred to as the drop safety. The drop safety is located right in the rear. And what that is is a shelf. So when the trigger is pulled all the way to the rear, we've disengaged the lever, we've disengaged the firing pin safety, and now the only safety remaining left is the drop safety. Up to the point where you hit the connector, the trigger bar is held up, so it will not release the striker. The trigger bar drops to release the striker to fire the cartridge. So you have all three. So the other thing about the firing pin safety is, too, is as soon as you release the trigger, they will all re-engage in that order. Of course, your drop safety will always be engaged until the trigger is pulled all the way to the rear. But when you release the trigger, you re-engage the firing pin safety. And then when you release the trigger, you re-engage the lever. Now, what this does also, which uh, is, is probably what I really like about it, is every trigger pull is the exact same, usually around five and a half pounds. The first pull is the same as the last pull. So unlike a traditional single double where you may have a 12 and a half uh, double action long pull, then it drops to a you know five and a half pound pull. Your first shot, you're probably going to shoot uh, low, and your next shot, you're going to shoot high. That's not the case with the with a safe action pistol. Every trigger pull is the same. And once you get used to it, it's extremely easy to use. Some other features about the Glock 17 that have been really, really interesting is its simplicity. 
there's only 34 parts in this pistol to uh, to make it function, uh, as opposed to all the small and tiny parts you see on traditional firearms. And with only 34 parts, there's that much less that can go wrong. And another neat feature about this pistol is it was designed to fire underwater for uh, Austrian, like the Austrian seals, uh, Austrian Cobra, and so forth. Which that allowed you to do is to fire a semi-automatic pistol underwater. It had a special uh, set of firing pin cups that allowed the water to flow through rather than the hydraulic pressure to keep it from firing underwater. It's not necessarily safe. You need to know what you're doing and be trained to use it. But it's pretty cool when, it's, when, it's, when a gun can fire underwater. Obviously, you want to use full metal jacket ammunition due to the fact that you don't want it opening up in the barrel. Uh, but that's another really, really neat feature. Now comes 1982. The Glock 17 was now adopted as the P80 pistol by the Austrian military. Come 1984 was Glock's second major contract, which was to the Norwegian Army for the same model Glock 17 pistol. Well, you knew it was sooner or later this was going to come to the American market. Uh, so in 1985, the Glock 17 pistol and the Glock 19 pistol, which is the compact 15-shot uh, magazine, a little short of a barrel, the pistol was uh, sent to ATF for it to see if it would be able to be imported. Now we're going to move forward to uh, 1985 with the... Uh, importation into the United States. Now, as you may or may not know, the ATF has what they call a point system, which uh, for a firearm to be imported into the country, you have to have a certain number of points. And that those points are for barrel, you know, for barrel length, for weight, for all different types of things for caliber. And the Glock 17, as it was submitted, um, was just shy of enough points to be imported. So what, what Mr. Glock did was he had to create a Adjustable rear sight, a fully adjustable rear sight, which is referred to as the weekend sight. Because once Mr. Glock found out that he needed an adjustable sight, over a weekend he developed this sight. So once he had this sight on here, he was able to import the Model uh, 17 into the United States. The 19 required one more thing. Um, the trigger on the Model 17s is smooth in the front. Well, uh, Glock 19 had to have a serrated trigger, which you had uh, serrations on the top of it, which permitted it to be a tactical or a competition trigger, which pushed it over the points uh, system so it could get into the country. The plant was set up in Smyrna, Georgia. As it was uh, set up, it was primarily for importation, assembly, um, distribution, and also as a warranty station. And the pistol, as it came into the United States, uh, it it hit with a storm. Um, the first major police department was the New York State Police, uh, who adopted the pistol. Quite quickly after that, there became a major media frenzy about it. The, because it was manufactured out of polymer, there was uh, a writer who said that it was said this pistol could pass and penetrate airport metal detectors and x-ray machines. And it was said that this pistol was being, or could be used by the Libyans at the time, as terrorist uh, weapons. Well, Mr. Glock had to take care of that right quickly. That was not the case. 83% of this pistol is steel, which we will take it apart. We'll take a look at that. Now, even in, first off, inside of this magazine, you would be able to see 17 cartridges very, very easily. Now, looking at the frame, yes, we have a polymer frame, but we have a steel trigger bar. We have a steel locking block. We have a steel spring, a steel connector. So we have steel. Now we look at the slide. With the exception of the original recoil spring guide, everything is steel. So you would clearly be able to pick this up on any uh, airport metal detector or uh, x-ray machine, uh, which is completely false. And what also didn't help was uh, the first time it was introduced into Hollywood. The first time the pistol was introduced into Hollywood was the movie Die Hard with Bruce Willis. And what came out in there was uh, the gun was described as the Glock 7, a porcelain gun made in Germany that would... Uh, penetrate your airport metal detectors and such. Which, first off, there was no Glock 7. Second of all, the slide is not made out of uh, porcelain, it's made out of steel. And I do recall uh, reading someplace that uh, one of the technical experts advised against that being in the movie because the fact was it wasn't true, but it was written into the movie, so therefore it was going to stay in there. And as you're going to see, we'll, we'll, we've shown you some pictures of what a Glock looks like going through an airport metal detector. And Glock also categorically denied that they had ever sold any guns to the Libyans. So it just goes to show you how people can take uh, something and twist it uh, and to cause a, pretty much of a major problem uh, for a manufacturer trying to get the pistol that was out. But uh, what, again, what we see here is a Generation 1 pistol, very, very similar to the P90, the actual Austrian and Norwegian pistols. You can see we have a very smooth frame, a little pebbles on here. It's very, very easy grip. The grip actually was done by testing, I believe it was over 300 uh, people uh, for the grip angle to have the uh, 
proper grip angle. But what you'll also notice is the fact that this uh, bore axis is very, very low to your to your arm. And that was done for a reason also. The lower the bore axis is to your arm, the more, the less recoil, less muzzle flip that you feel. Uh, that's one of the areas where this pistol shined also is because of that low bore axis. It had less felt recoil than many, many pistols in its class. And this remained in production until 1998. And then came the Generation 2. What we have here is the Generation 2. There's a nice little story behind this one. This is the first Glock that I ever bought in 1994 on my 21st birthday. Uh, again, at that time, I was carrying a Beretta. I was very hard-pressed to, to look at the Glock because, again, the, the polymer uh, had frightened me. But the gentleman that I work with, uh, Fred Calcagno, an American sportsman, he was very fond of the Glock. He carried a Glock 22, and he told me you need to use it. So I did, and it was okay. I, you know, I, did, I still like my Beretta. It wasn't until I went to work for Laser Max where I headed up their um, testing and evaluation department where I was doing endurance testing, and I had a Generation 2 which I documented over 76,000 rounds with only two parts breakages, which were the trigger return spring. That was it. Same barrel, same frame, same everything. And that is what sold me. When you have a pistol you have that much experience with and the thing works and it works every time, um, you couldn't help but uh, get fond of it, get good with it. And I ended up switching over to my carry gun ever since uh, to Glock. Uh, but again, this was my first Glock pistol. Now, the major difference between the Generation 1 and Generation 2 is the frame. As you can see, we have uh, checkering on the back. We have striations, and we have some uh, gripping surfaces here. We have the same kind of a texture as on the first. And if we look on the front, we'll see serrations on the front strap and on the trigger guard. The frame and the slide remain pretty much the same. So one of the uh, probably most significant improvements in the, within the Gen 1 was around 1991. They replaced the standard recoil spring with a captive system, which the captive system was much, much easier to install and take out. Another thing I want to talk about with this too is the type of recoil spring that's on here. This is what's referred to as a flat recoil spring. A flat recoil spring has much more bearing surface than a standard rocket wire, which makes the spring last a lot longer uh, than, than standard rocket wire recoil spring. So it's definitely a product improvement. You do have a polymer guide rod. Now, contrary to popular belief, polymer guide rods are not cheap. It, this is a low-stress part, which its sole purpose is to keep the spring in alignment. Uh, so it's the fact that its polymer does not have any kind of bearing on it whatsoever for durability or reliability. In 1992, Glock had their first recall. Uh, what it was was a replacement of the firing pin safety. Now, what was happening was there was a possibility if the pistol was to be dropped that the firing pin safety uh, could slip. So what Glock did was they released a whole kit for the, for the uh, frame, which consisted of the trigger bar, the firing pin, firing pin safety, firing pin spring, and so forth. And what Glock would do is you would go by serial number. And if the serial number fell within the recall, um, a Glock trained armor or the Glock factory would replace the entire parts kit. And then uh, they would, you would return those parts to them. And that was, it was voluntary, but uh, yeah, it, was, it was somewhat mandatory, but it was well worth getting the, uh, the upgrade. Uh, back in those days, I was a Glock armor, and uh, I had done that for a lot of people. Uh, I would just call up with a serial number. They would send me out the new, the new parts. I would install them in the gun, and I would send uh, the parts back to Glock, so Glock could describe they wanted the parts out of circulation. That was in the 1990, 1992 time period. Another change that was made on the Glock 17 uh, Gen 2 was the induction of a drop-free magazine. In the American market, it was not going to be acceptable to have a magazine that did not drop free. So Glock introduced, uh, by putting a larger steel liner in here, that uh, this magazine would drop free, whether it was empty or whether it had rounds in it. Uh, so that was the other big change with the Generation 2. The next gen generation was the, was the Gen 3 in 1998. Now this had some uh, changes as well, and it was mostly to the frame. As we see here on the frame, we have finger grooves, which was a major, major enhancement. Now, some like it, some didn't. For me, it fit me well. I liked it. Uh, for some others, that you know, that they didn't. And most importantly, was the introduction of the Glock Universal Rail. What this enabled you to do is to attach a Glock tactical light or laser. Um, there was actually three of these that were offered. The first one was just a tactical light. The second one was a tactical light and a laser. Uh, you could have a, you know, just a tactical light. You could have just a laser. You could have a combination of both. And the third permitted you to have infrared, so you'd be able to use uh, it with night vision. This was not a 1913 rail. Uh, Glock has made a couple versions with 1913 rails, but this was a proprietary rail system. But this also had the drop-free magazine, which that was, is what would be in production ever since uh, the, you would, you would never see a uh, non-drop-free magazine again in the U.S. 
This pistol also has Glocks night sights. Um, when these first came out, they were available with Trigicon night sights as well, uh, but now Glock has their own. Now, in 2003, uh, Glock also changed a little bit about the way they do their serial numbers. As you as you look, you have a serial number on the barrel and on the frame. For Europe and for anywhere else in the world, this is where the serial numbers are located. Uh, on the U.S., part of ATF's requirement was to put a steel plate in the frame so you would have the serial number in the frame. Now, up until 2003, Glock had a post fix that was always U.S. to indicate uh, it was a U.S. manufactured gun or gun manufactured for the U.S. market. That was finally dropped in 2003. So you have uh, your first three or four are generally going to be uh, alphas, then you're going to have three numericals. Another improvement on the Gen 3 was the addition of a, of a loaded cartridge indicator. As you see here, compared to the earlier generations, the extractor was smooth. But now we look on the Gen 3, we'll see we have a little bit of a notch here. The threads around the chamber of this uh, Glock Gen 3, the extractor would stick out and your finger would, be, would catch on this little notch right here. So you, you have a clear indicator that there's around the chamber. And as we can see right now, this is unloaded, so my finger just slides right across. But again, if it was loaded, that would be sticking out, my finger would catch that. Now, this would be offered as an upgrade. You could put one of these on any of the older pistols. In the 2009-2010 time period, Glock introduced their next generation, which is the Generation 4. This had several different changes. Now, let me tell you straight up here, this was a limited production uh, that it had the forward durations on the slide. The standard Gen 4s did not have this. This was a, there's a Glock 19 and a Glock 17 that were introduced with this. I happen to like it. Some do, some don't. So that's, uh, this is not normal. This was only on a special run. But first off, what happened was they took and they added a additional feature. Modularity became very, very important, uh, being able to custom fit the gun for the individual's hands. So what Glock introduced was removable back straps. There was uh, three of them that came with it. So you could go, you know, from small to large. And you also offered a, a little bit more of a beaver tail for those of us who have rather large hands like I do. That was part of the frame change. Now the magazine was also changed. Now it's, it was backwards compatible, but if we look right here, we'll see that that notch goes all the way around. Well, what that was, was the introduction of the reversible magazine release. This magazine release could be reversed for left or right handed. Now I have on here, this has not come this way, uh, this is an extended magazine release. One of the things that people don't realize about Glock is this was not really designed as a magazine release. This was, this was designed as a slide stop. When the pistol would go back on its last shot, it was meant to be slingshot. It was not meant to be released like this. But this was an American thing. Uh, Americans wanted to have this as more of a slide release than a slide stop, so this was uh, added. Now some of the competition models came with this, or you could buy them separately to install. So again, what this magazine does is it allows you to, to reverse your magazine catch so it'll work on either side. Now looking on the inside, another change on the frame was for all pistols would have the third pin. Traditionally, this third pin was only on the 9.9mm models. It wasn't necessary. So the models 17 and 19 uh, did not have this third pin. The Gen 3 made a uh, frame that was universal for all calibers, 9mm, 40, and 37 SIG. Biggest change was now we have a new spring. We actually got a chance to take a look at a preview of the Gen 4 with the models 26 and 27, uh, the miniature pistols. Now, those uh, subcompact pistols uh, had an embedded recoil spring where you had the variable recoil springs. Now, what this does is it absorbs more shock, less uh, recoil, and less, less uh, shock to the frame. So they were all switched to this. Now, slide was not compatible with the previous slide because, again, this was much, much larger than the, uh, tr than the tr traditional one. But uh, this made a big impact, I think, on, on felt recoil. Not that there was that much with the gun to begin with, but it was definitely that much more of an enhancement. 2016, Glock introduced what they called the MOS, or Meisler Optic System. I do not have one of those here, but what that was was a cutout in the back here that enabled you to uh, put an optic on there. Now we go current. In, in late 2017, uh, Glock introduced the newest generation, or the Gen 5. Now, the Gen 5 was based off of the FBI's G17M, and we'll get into a little bit of that too. You know, throughout the last, oh, I'd say 10, 15, 20 years, you saw a, a trend. In 1985, with the introduction of the M9 pistol for the U.S. government, you saw a lot of police departments switching over from 57 Magnum 38 Special over to 9mm. Uh, there was also an incident uh, that the FBI was, in, was engaged with where many of their officers were uh, killed because they were unable to match the firepower of the of the bad guys who had uh, semi-automatic pistols and they had 
uh, Mini 14. They were not able to match that firepower. So they switched to a uh, semi-automatic pistol. There was a little bit of caliber issues with that, but the 9mm became the standard for law enforcement. Uh, the department switched over from their revolvers over to the 9mm caliber. And uh, then, all of a sudden, 9mm wasn't good enough. They were having a lot of issues uh, with what they called stopping power problems. The introduction of the 40 s and w came out. The 40 s and w came out like a storm. Uh, it became the standard uh, caliber for law enforcement throughout this country. And there were departments who said they wanted to go back to the 45 as well. So you were going with mostly 40 and 45 being used in law enforcement. Then, with the advances of ammunition, 9mm came back into play. It was easier to shoot for most people. Uh, higher capacity, and generally with less recoil, they become more accurate. People are more uh, prone to be accurate with them. So now the, the pendulum has swung backwards to go with 9mm again. So the models that Glock first offered was the Glock 17 and Glock 19 in the Gen 5. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over this. This is not the same pistol. In fact, uh, there are no parts on here that are uh, compatible with any past generations with the exception of the magazine release. Uh, everything else has been changed. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to start with uh, the, the frame. As you see here, we still have the interchangeable back straps. Um, we also have no more finger grooves. Glock had gotten a lot of complaints from people about that. You know, it, it's a very hard thing because you have a certain segment of the population who liked them, someone who, who didn't. And you cannot ever make everybody happy. Uh, so Glock decided that they would get rid of the finger grooves. The next thing was we have a new finish on here. We have a finish which has a what they call NDLC, which is a much better finish now. The original finishes that were on here on the Gen 1 was a, a tenifer finish with a black coating on the outside. Now, the tenifer finish was as hard as a diamond. In fact, the Austrian Army, uh, these guys used to sharpen their bayonets on it, which is how, how strong of a material that it was. But when it came to the U.S., the U.S. production was set up. Um, we could not do that process here in the United States because of EPA laws because it was a cyanide-based. So Glock had switched to a different process, which is what you see here today. The next major improvement came to the barrel. As we spoke before, we had a polygon barrel with shallow rifling. This was referred to as the Glock's marksmanship barrel, where the big difference is you have a sharp edge uh, on the rifling that gives you that leading edge to improve accuracy. By having that leading edge in there, it sort of bridges the gap between the benefits of having a, a polygon-type barrel versus a standard-cut barrel. Uh, it gives you a little bit more accuracy, and I will say that you do see a, a little bit of an accuracy when you shoot the gun. The Glock marksmanship barrel is certainly an enhancement in accuracy. You'll be able to tell a Gen 5 barrel because it says 5 on the top. The next feature was the ambidextrous features. Of course, we have from a Gen 4 the ambidextrous magazine release. Now we have an ambidextrous slide stop for both sides, so it enables somebody who was left or right-handed to be able to uh, release the slide if they so choose, rather than do the slingshot method. Now, for the most part, again, I normally don't use those. I use the, the slingshot method, but for those who do, um, this was certainly an enhancement, which makes this gun fully ambidextrous. You have no manual safety. Your magazine released, it can be reversed, and now you have your slide stop as well. The magazine well was slightly flared to make uh, loading and low-level light conditions a little bit more easy. Another improvement came to the magazine. Um, what we have now is we have a Orange follower. Uh, orange follower, I'm, I'm pretty fond of. I think that's a, it's a good safety enhancement. And there's also a recontour of the floor plate. As you can see, if you compare, now here on, on this side we have the Gen 3, and here we have the Gen 5. You can notice that this is a little bit uh, more of a slope to it. Uh, it makes it a little bit more comfortable on the bottom, doesn't uh, snag as much, and doesn't stick out as much. It certainly is an enhancement. There's only one gun that I'm aware of in Glock's arsenal that this will not fit, and that is the 19X. Uh, the frame on the 19X has a lip that comes over it, so you would not be able to use uh, a Gen 5 magazine in a 19X. Next thing that we have is an improved firing pin safety. Now, we got a, a, a look at the Glock Gen 5 early on with the introduction of the models 42 and 43. But you notice we have a reshaped, a more aggressive firing pin safety which is uh, certainly, you know, so firing pin safety is the most important safety on this gun, in my opinion, uh, and having an improvement to that is excellent. As you can see, we also have a multi-spring uh, recoil spring assembly. However, this is not compatible with any of the previous generations. Same thing with the barrel. You cannot drop a Gen 5 Glock 17 barrel into a Gen 1, 2, 3, or 4. It is not compatible. Uh, and same thing with the recoil spring. This is not compatible with the Gen 4. This is a separate Gen 5. Now, when we look into the, the frame, we have an entirely redesigned trigger mechanism. None of the parts that you see see here are compatible with anything that was previous. 
you know, change in the way the recoil spring was in the back here. As I told you, when I had that pistol that had over 75,000 rounds through it, the only parts that broke were just the trigger return spring. The way this has been redesigned, the same way it was in the 42 and 43, it makes that spring that much more reliable and much, that much more durable. But again, a lot of you guys who saw this pistol uh, said, well, it's just the same thing, just with lipstick and rouge change. No, it's not. This entire mechanism has been redesigned. Uh, all the contours, uh, safety enhancements, and so forth. So this is not the same as the previous four generations. Now, there's a slight increase by about uh, two or three ounces on it. Uh, other than that, not much of a difference at all. And the first models that were introduced, again, were the 17 and 19, because that's what law enforcement was calling for. The next thing we're going to look at is sort of the evolution of the magazines. And again, we're just looking at the Glock 17. Uh, starting over here, we have the first generation magazine, which was the uh, one that was given to the Austrian army. As you look at the base plate, you'll see they're solid. There's no uh, locking plate on there. And also, I want you to take a look at the contour on here. You can see the way the contour goes up here. Both sides are, the, are, are equal. Uh, that was the first generation, and there was only a small steel liner in the back here, uh, but it did not keep it from swelling. There was a second generation that came out for the Gen 1 and the Gen 2, which had a larger steel insert in the rear uh, for durability. It did not increase uh, you know, its ability to, for a drop reef. It was still a, a magazine that would swell. When you look in the bottom, now we have a locking plate that goes with the uh, base. These were originally, you would just pinch the sides and then we would pop off the rear. Now we have a, a locking plate. The next one is the Gen 2 and this is the full drop free magazine. We have a, a full liner that goes around uh, the magazine which keeps it from swelling. You can definitely see that by the metal inserts that you see which allows you to see your round count here. Another way that you can tell the difference is you see how you have this U shape here and now we have this, this uh, squared off cut right here. That's also an indication of the uh, liner that's in it. Now at this point we had the assault weapon ban. Uh, which restricted the high-capacity magazines in 1994. The magazines uh, from 1994 until 2004 would have the restricted law enforcement government use only written on the back of the back of the magazine. I don't have one of those to show you, but I do have the next generation magazines. The biggest change that comes in with the magazines from the, this era is the front. As what we see here is a standard magazine which only had the uh, the right-handed magazine released. It was on the left-hand side of the pistol. We have that same thing here, but we have the addition of this little piece right here. Now, what this was designed for was a magazine that had an ambi release. Uh, it was called the Model 17 MB, and that had basically sort of like a, like the HK USP type trigger where it caught from the front. Never caught on, uh, was never put into production, but uh, the magazines would come with this as well. Next, we have the Gen 4 with the major difference. We had the engagement areas, so you could either have the magazine release on the left or the right-hand side. For those who are living in occupied states where there's still an issue with pre band versus post band magazines, there still is a way to tell the difference between a pre band magazine and a post band magazine. And that is actually by the location of the writing. If you notice 9mm, it's between the two areas right here in the shoulder. If you look at these three, you'll see the 9mm was moved up to this area in here. This is an indication of post band magazines. That was moved up because when they would mark restricted law enforcement government use only, they needed more room in there, so they moved that 9mm up. So when the, the assault weapon ban sunset, uh, they removed that from the mold, so you no longer had that restricted law enforcement government use only, but you still had the indicators that stated these were uh, post-ban versus pre-ban magazine. Again, lower area uh, beneath the shoulder is pre-ban. With it up right underneath the, the, the catch right here, that's going to be post-ban. Lastly, we had the Gen 5. The Gen 5 is basically the exact same magazine as the uh, Gen 4, with the addition of now a uh, fluorescent orange follower. This follower is available to retrofit any of your pre-existing magazines with. No change in, in function, it just is more of a safety, so you can tell when the magazine is empty. The other change was to the floor plate. If you look at the two floor plates, you will see how this one comes up and is rounded off a lot easier, and this one here will sit in the gun a little bit better, it won't stick out as much, a little more comfortable. And of course, you can get the locking plate and the, uh, the base plate to update any of your magazines. The only thing worth noting on this is that the Gen 5 magazines will not work in the 19X because there's a lip on the mag front of the magazine well that uh, will not accept this longer part right here. You can see that this sits out farther. Because of this extended area, this will not fit in the frame of a Glock 19X because you have the tab that goes over the front. 
Last I want to show you is, um, you know, again, everything I've been showing you is, is all uh, Glock OEM equipment, but there are two uh, magazines that are out now, uh, which I actually feel are very good magazines. Uh, they work flawlessly. I've been using them quite a bit. The first is the ETS magazine, which is a complete translucent magazine. So you can actually see the rounds in there. It's actually pretty educational because you can see the round stack in here. How uh, you go from double column down here up into single here. The next one is Magpul. Now, uh, I am a big Magpul fan. Always have been, always will. They make absolute excellent uh, equipment. You notice they also went with an orange follow. This is a little bit dirty because as you can see, it's very well used. The other thing they have here is they got rid of the uh, notches on the back for, for being able to see how many rounds were in there. They only have one there for 17. Their thought was, was when you're in an environment where you have sand, this, this allows sand to get into the magazine, which could cause issues. Uh, so they went with the idea of having this thing all closed up and just having the one here so you could tell when the magazine was fully loaded. So today we've gone through the Generation 1 through Gen 5 advancements. Uh, we can see step by step how the pistol has evolved over the time. The overall concept for the pistol and the overall way that it works has not changed. Uh, the, the, the system is basically the same. They've only gone and improved it throughout the generations. Now, any manufacturer who put out, puts out a, a product, there should never be a finalized design. There's always one more thing you can do or a couple things that you can do to make the best even better. And although Mr. Glock says Glock perfection, you know, he even realizes that we can always improve. Uh, a lot of these improvements over the years have been cosmetic. It's been the grips. It's been making the gun more comfortable for the shooter, making it more adaptable to anybody's hands. Uh, if you look at the mechanics of the inside, very little has been changed uh, other than the firing pin safety, which, again, making the best even better. You can always make something better. You can always make a better safety. But uh, the Glock continues to evolve, uh, and I'm sure we'll see Gen 6s and so forth. Materials have been incredible. This pistol has become probably the most successful pistol in history. I know there's some of you 1911 guys who will say, oh, no, it's the 1911. Uh, but uh, no, uh, this pistol is used by so many countries, it's unbelievable. It equips some of the most elite military teams in the world, including our own military. Our own uh, Navy SEALs are using the Glock 19. I don't think there's any pistol that's out there uh, commercially in use today that is more combat proven than the Glock system. And it continues to take very, very large contracts through countries throughout the world. Law enforcement, Glock, last number I heard was over 60, 60 to 70 percent of law enforcement in this country using Glock pistols. And why is that? Simplicity, durability, reliability. These are one of the few pistols in the industry where you can actually fire plus P plus ammunition and it will not hurt it. Um, you have regular steel frames. You have a, that wears, you have metal hitting metal. It wears. This pistol here will fire plus P plus all day long. It will fire underwater reliably. Because you have such few parts, you have such fewer things that can go wrong. And also, if you look at the price point of Glock, you, you may not see it as a consumer. But Glock's prices really have not changed uh, since 1985 when they came to the country. They pretty much kept the prices the same for, uh, for especially for the law enforcement and military systems, uh, and they've not increased that. Now, of course, you have your dealers who will, but uh, the pistol has pretty much stayed. Their staple has always been the polygon barrel. It's always been uh, the best barrel that they're never going to wear out. You have a finish on here uh, throughout the generations that is impervious to corrosion. Uh, regardless of whether you have a lot of acid in your system, you get it on the frame, frame obviously the polymer is not going to rust. The slide's not going to rust. You know, looking at these earlier finishes, if you were to get any brass onto here, you'd be able to scrape the brass right off. The, not, you know, nothing is stronger than this finish. Even if the black was to come off, you still had your hardened finish on there, the weapon would not corrode. So you have a barrel that lasts forever, you have, not, you have no corrosion, you have a stronger frame that will... Uh, absorb the shock of using the most high, highest pressure ammunition, and you have a good price. You have a simple trigger where you're able to have the, your same shot from your first pull to your last, which is, uh, is in my opinion, easier to shoot than a, a traditional double single. And you have a gun that is so safe that it has been dropped from a helicopter and it will not discharge. I have never seen one of these pistols fail or even read about one failing uh, because there is no manual safety. The manual safety issue is primarily one of an individual or uh, the feelings of, an, of a particular firearms instructor. Now, we carried revolvers forever, uh, and they did not have a manual safety. If you didn't want to fire, you kept your finger off the trigger. Glock pistols are the exact same way. If you don't want to fire, you don't put your finger on the trigger. Manual safeties can be viewed different ways. Uh, there was two police departments back home in New York uh, who had very different ideas. Uh, one police department, which is actually Rochester Police Department, uh, see Rochester, uh, they would never accept a firearm that didn't have a manual safety. They carried Berettas with the manual safeties engaged. 
our Monroe County sheriffs didn't really care about their manual safety, but they wanted to decocker, but they carried it with the safety off. Thought being, if by the time you have to pull out that gun in an emergency, you may not remember to flip that safety off. And if you don't flip that safety off, you may lose critical time. With this pistol, it's always ready to go. Uh, and I view that as a, I've always viewed that as a, as a plus. Oddly enough, that police department now carries Glocks. Uh, for a long time in my area in upstate New York where I grew up, uh, that was predominantly Beretta. Of course, we were mostly Italians up there too. But we had Beretta. Uh, and over the last four or five years, you've seen a complete switch going over to Glock. All those agencies now are carrying Glock 21s. So uh, for as far as the going off unintentionally, if you don't pull the trigger, it will not fire. You can drop it. You can throw it. Uh, it's been proven time and time again in all kinds of drop tests that this thing is completely safe if you were to drop it. So you have a proven system, probably the most produced pistol in the world right now. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more from them to come. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, if you do, please click like, please subscribe, even better share. Please consider donating to our Patreon. Thank you.